Welcome to St. John's, whether you are watching with us live or worshiping at your own time. We continue with our series, Behind the Music, looking at some familiar and not so familiar hymns. Today's hymn is a relatively new one, and therefore you may not know it until all are fed. It was written in 2010 by a Presbyterian minister, but we're gonna hear a little bit more about that uh, uh, sometime later. For right now, I just wanna remind you to fill out a survey if you haven't yet had the chance to do so. It just helps Sam and I know better ways to serve the St. John's community. And also next Sunday, February 7th, we want to try something new. Worship will be a live Zoom where we will be sharing in communion together. Following that worship Zoom, there will be a brief time of fellowship as well. And it's just because it's been a while since we have all gathered, been able to see each other. So please join us on that Sunday morning. Now let us take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we take a look at other opportunities to live out our life of faith. Let us worship God. Why have you come to this place? We have come to find Jesus. Why have you come today? We are tired in body and spirit. Give food you fit and be at ease. We are hungry with nothing to eat. Come and eat your fill. But there are only five barley loaves and two fish. There is plenty for all. Will we find wholeness here? Jesus gathers the fragments of our lives that nothing may be lost.
Friends, we come together for our prayer of forgiveness, not to gather in our shame, but to acknowledge our humanness and invite God to give us the strength, the courage, and the wisdom to do better and renew us and restore us. So join with me as we pray together. God, our provider, we come believing in our emptiness, believing that we will never have enough, believing that what we have is unworthy. We come fearful of sharing, fearful of losing our tenuous grip on security, fearful of touching and knowing the pain of others. We come overwhelmed by the hunger, overwhelmed by the suffering of children near and far, overwhelmed by the endless tales of senseless violence, greed, and death. We come aching from the weight of the responsibility, aching from the chilling challenge of knowing our abundance, aching from the gnawing awareness that we have much to share. We come clinging to our meager lunches. Bless them and us. Break them and us. Share them and us. May we embrace the abundance of your love. May we be freed by the generosity of your grace. May we share in the miracle of the fishes and loaves. By being just as abundant and generous with what you have given us, and what we have received. Amen. And now, friends, it is in that abundance that we share the peace of Christ. We share God's love uh, with as many as we can. So wherever you are, just take a moment. Stop what you're doing. Text someone. Hug someone. Send someone a Facebook message. Shoot someone an email. uh, However you'd like to share the peace of Christ with the world today. Today's song, Until All Are Fed, was written by a Presbyterian minister, Brian McFarland, in 2010. And at the time, McFarland worked for the Presbyterian Hunger Program, whose mission is to alleviate hunger and eliminate its causes through advocacy, education, sustainable development, and providing direct relief to people in need. McFarland wrote this song as a part of an album to raise money and awareness for the hunger program. And he believed that there is absolutely no reason that any person in a country as wealthy as ours and as well-resourced as ours should go hungry. I first heard this song in 2011 when I attended the World Council of Churches International Ecumenical Peace Convocation in Kingston, Jamaica, representing the Presbyterian Church USA denomination. The World Council of Churches, which encompasses churches of all denominations from across the world, focused 10 years on the ways to eliminate violence and promote peace. Alleviating hunger is key if truly there is to be peace in the world. This song echoes the patterns of a lament song. How long, O Lord? This song is also confessional because it calls us to ask ourselves what we are going to do about it. The song also is prophetic in that it gives an answer to what a world where we all are fed could truly, truly look like.
Today's scripture is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It is a story that is found in all four Gospels. So hear today's word. May God enrich us, enlighten us, and open our hearts. When Jesus heard what had happened to John the Baptist, that he had been put to death by King Herod, he got on a boat and went away to a deserted place by himself. But the crowds heard where he headed and followed him on foot from many towns and villages. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed those who were sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him. This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus answered, responded, there's no need to send them away. You can give them something to eat here. But we don't have enough food to feed everyone. We only have five small loaves of bread and two fish. Bring the loaves of bread and the fish to me. So the disciples brought him the loaves and fish. And Jesus told the people to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them, and broke the bread into pieces. Then he gave the bread to the disciples, and the disciples passed them to the crowds. And everyone ate until they were full. Afterward, they filled the 12 baskets with the leftovers. In total, about 5,000 men had eaten, not to mention all the women and children. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Today's scripture centers around food, particularly feeding, my favorite topic. My earliest memories are all memories of food, and these memories are attached to a very specific place and person. I was born in Melbourne, Florida, and lived alongside the Indian River, which is separated by the Atlantic Ocean with a thin strip of land. And my parents had just immigrated from South Korea, so money was very tight. But I don't ever remember having, not having enough food to eat. See, our next door neighbors were an elderly couple that adopted me as their grandchild, which means I was regularly spoiled with treats and goodies. Grandpa Nick had a homemade chocolate business and would make these melt-in-your-mouth chocolate-covered caramels. And I, of course, was in charge of quality control and got to taste test every chocolate from every batch. Grandma Jean would make key lime pie using none other than a lime jello mix. And she would let me lick the batter off the beaters. At home, we always ate rice and kimchi. And back in the 70s, there was no Whole Foods or Asian markets where you could buy kimchi. My mother would have to improvise with what she could that, and what she found at the grocery store. And she would pack the cabbage in jars to ferment. My first taste of American food was this, a Burger King Whopper. And I remember the Whopper being the size of my five-year-old head. We never had the money to go out to eat, so I knew I had to relish every bite of my first hamburger, and I did it. I managed to eat the whole thing all by myself to my parents' surprise. Memories of food can be like a time machine. It can recall specific moments and people. Memories of food has a way of collecting data on who we are and where we came from. 
To this day, the foods I crave are all things citrus, seafood, has a sour note, or caramelly center. And I wonder if that is why so much of Jesus' ministry is centered around food. That in order to know and remember who Jesus is and who and whose we are, we are reminded in the act of feeding. After all, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In the Gospel of John, the wedding of Cana is the first miracle that Jesus does. When the wine runs out, Jesus turns water into wine so that the celebration can continue. Today's scripture is one of the few events that is accounted for in all four Gospels. And while the details are slightly different, the miracle of Jesus feeding 5,000 with just a few baskets of fishes and loaves is the same which invites us to wonder what is so important about this event? What is the miracle that is being witnessed? Here, Jesus is surrounded by a crowd, about 5,000 people, even more if you count the women and the children, all hungry for something, something they can't quite grasp yet, but they recognize something amazingly different in a not yet revealed savior, Jesus Christ, so much so that the day before they followed him across the Sea of Galilee and stayed with him until evening, until Jesus took refuge on a mountain. They continued to search for him the next day and got into boats where they found Jesus in Capernaum, a city about 10 miles away. No thought to where they may sleep or how they will eat. Some even traveled as a family, kids, young and old. And the more miraculous signs the crowd witnessed, the more consumed they were in wanting to find out who Jesus is. What did they believe Jesus had to offer them that was worth following him to the ends of the earth and neglect their basic needs of food and shelter? With all the miracles, who did they imagine Jesus to be? Magician, healer, prophet, messiah? Surprisingly, it probably isn't what we expect, that like a magician, Jesus magically is able to multiply food enough for a few into food enough for thousands. If that is the miracle of the story, what would that show? What would that prove? If you compare this story in all four Gospels, it leaves it up to our imagination to figure out how Jesus managed to feed so many. So let's use our imagination. The funny thing is, I know that if this happened in Korea or the Korean church I grew up in, the story would be very different. The worst thing you could do as a Korean is not have enough food to feed people, which is why my mom cooks enough for 25 people when there is only six at the table. When I was little, food was a communal experience. Everyone eats from the same pot and dips their spoons into the same dish and I actually rarely recall feeding myself because I had so many aunties and uncles asking me to open my mouth as they shoved food in it. But fear, fear has a way of breeding greed, which has a way of breeding scarcity. And we begin to believe that there is actually not enough. We rely on savings like sayings like pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, convincing ourselves that our success is solely that, ours. And if we need an example of that, we only have to go down to the toilet paper aisle of the grocery store. If only Jesus could multiply toilet paper the way he multiplies fishes, we could all be saved. I wonder if the miracle of today's story is people opening up their own baskets, whatever little they think they had, in order to share it with their neighbor next to them. I have a hard time believing that this crowd followed Jesus on a whim with no provisions for even the basic needs. We human beings aren't wired like that. I believe maybe they searched and desperately followed Jesus out of their own personal need for a miracle, only to find that the answer, the miracle, was with them all along. So simple. Believe in the abundance. Believe that there is enough. In John's version of the story, it was a young boy, a child who set the example, who offered his basket of merely two fish and five barley loaves that set a ripple effect of 5,000 to be fed. Here, Jesus conducts his first Lord's Supper 
It says, he took the bread and broke it with his own hands and gave thanks. That is a sign to us that this moment is to be remembered. Every time we participate in the Lord's Supper, we are to remember that Jesus is about abundance and generosity, whether it comes to food, love, or acceptance. By breaking the bread with Jesus' own hands, we essentially get a taste of who he is. There's a Korean saying that a cook's hands decides the flavor of the food. Koreans call this sonmat, which literally means the taste of one's hands. So many of the dishes I grew up eating were made and mixed by hand. Sonmat is also scientific. Different hands offer a particular flavor even when cooking the same dish. Rob Dunn, a, biologi a biologist, says that hands collect data from the daily experiences of life and records different stories of one person from another. The bacteria and microbes found on hands determines the taste of the food. Who Jesus is and who we are is discovered and rediscovered at the Lord's table. Same bread and same cup. But it is not only the sonmat of Jesus, it's our stories as well. The table is where stories are shared and bread is broken from different hands. The table is where community is fed, nurtured, created, and established. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper is vital to the Christian practice of community. It is a meal prepared by God where all are invited. It is a meal where our lives intersect. I'm always surprised on Saturday mornings how many people are able to be fed. That every Saturday morning, 5,000 to 7,000 pounds of food is dropped off. Each household receives about 15 to 20 pounds of food in, in their bags. People not only pick up food for themselves, but they share it with their neighbors. Some of the food goes to the shanty project that supports those who are terminally ill. Some of the food goes to Hamilton families that support families who are experiencing homelessness or are housing vulnerable. The rest goes to St. Anne's home, just down the street, which is what is more surprising is that the abundance of food of the neighborhood, support we've received from neighbors waking up early to pack these bags, neighbors who notice worn out shopping carts and donate new ones to hand out, neighbors who ensure that everyone has enough clean masks in order to stay safe and healthy during this pandemic, neighbors who brainstorm possibilities to ensure that our clients receive their vaccinations. I'm grateful for this weekly reminder of today's scripture because I find myself needing it. Living in a city of such wealth, yet such disparity between the haves and have nots. And it boggles my mind that in a city named after the patron saint of the poor, there is not enough resources to solve the ever increasing food insecurity, how affordable housing and growing homelessness in our city. And yet we know there is. So the question and invitation for us is to start by asking the question from the lyrics, how can we stand by and fail to be aghast? How long till we do what's right? How could we stand by and choose a lesser fast? How long till we see the light? And the answer is, until all are fed. Let us feed one another until no one is hungry. Let us feed one another so that no one is lonely let us feed one another so that we are reminded of who we are and whose we are. Let us feed one another because we delight in sharing the sonmat of each other's stories and fill up on the mutual understanding and love built from tasting and hearing those stories. Let us be ever transformed and touched by the relationships built by people that we may not have known we would be in relationships with, and yet it is their stories that change us, that reveal in us God's truth, God's justice, and God's love. Come eat. The table is always prepared. There is always enough. Amen. Let us pray together. Loving God, you are our creator and sustainer. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. 
And so we look to you whenever we are in need, trusting in your love and your abundant goodness. As you once fed the hungry crowds with five loaves and two small fish, we ask that you would again fill those who are empty this day. Pour out your spirit on all who hunger and thirst. We pray for those who are physically hungry, whose stomachs are empty. We think especially of the people in our neighborhood and in our city and across the globe who are facing critical food shortages, who are suffering the effects of malnutrition and starvation and watching helplessly as loved ones die. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. We pray for those who are empty emotionally, who are lonely and long for companionship and love, who are caught in the grip of depression or overwhelmed with grief. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. We pray for those who are spiritually empty, who are troubled but don't know where to turn, who long for purpose and meaning but don't know where to look, who need you but do not yet know you. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. God, we praise you for your abundant gifts in our lives. Pour out your spirit on us as well. Fill us with your compassion and love so that we would willingly share some of our abundance with those who have need. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand. Pour out your spirit so that we may be filled. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who came so that all of humanity might come to know the abundant life that comes from you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> 